Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 708 of the podcast and it is Friday the 11th of August 2023 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Tonya Ellis about writing books for children, how to work with an illustrator, different products you can make alongside your books, different ways to publish as well as marketing to adults who buy for children and how to make school visits profitable and another income stream for your author business. And of course, valuing our time is important, whatever genre you write, as the publishing industry is notorious for not paying authors for speaking. So you should get some ideas, whatever genre you write in. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing things, well, lots going on. (laughs) In traditional publishing, Publishing Perspectives reports that investment company KKR will buy Simon & Schuster less than a year after a federal federal (laughs) federal judge in late October 2022 blocked Penguin Random House from acquiring Simon & Schuster. So KKR are... Uh, you know, uh, a finance company, an investment firm, and they have noted a commitment to growth and also to employees. Now, they own a lot of different companies in many different areas. Really interesting company if you go and have a look. They, uh, yeah, and they own companies in the publishing space, including Overdrive, which distributes ebooks to libraries. And my books are on Overdrive. I'm sure yours are too. Um, they, interestingly, they sold audiobooks.com to Storytel. So that's interesting. I'm not sure what that might mean for Simon & Schuster audiobooks, whether that's something they're interested in. But if you are published by a Simon & Schuster imprint, there are no doubt changes ahead. There always are in these situations. But certainty is generally better for business than uncertainty. So at least that has happened. Uh, They were always going to be sold. So it's interesting that that is now done. In more indie space, Written Word Media launched subscriber surge giveaways. And of course, Ricky Wolman from Written Word Media was here last week talking about the theme park of exciting rides for publishing and book marketing. And this is one of those things. So the goal is to help authors grow their newsletter subscriber base with engaged readers via the power of ebook giveaways. Subscriber surge giveaways feature selected ebooks in genre specific giveaway offerings, um, giving readers a chance to win the books. There are eight initial genres with more to come and written word media will deliver the ebooks. Now, of course, that is a paid promotion. It's always good to have more options for reaching readers, but I also just wanted to say on the other side of that, numbers on an email list are not a definition of success, especially if your list is made up of people who want free ebooks. So if you do this kind of promotion on any of the sites, and of course there are lots of options for doing this, make sure you also have a method for cleaning your list over time. And I mention this because I'm just as guilty of this as anyone else. I tend to do it every couple of years, whereas I should probably have some automated process. But email lists cost money over a certain size and uh, you need to make sure you're getting a return on your investment. So the lovely Jane Friedman has been up to a lot this week. You've probably seen her in various news articles. Uh, Jane has been on this show a number of times, very well known in the author community, produces a hot sheet, which I uh, think is wonderful. It's a paid email newsletter. Her blog is incredible. And first, before we get into other things, Jane put out her annual update of the key book publishing paths this week or reasonably recently. Um, I saw this this week. Uh, This has been something that Jane has updated every year for, I don't know, must be a decade or so. And it's very interesting because at the beginning there were almost just two options and now that it has splintered into so many. And I'll link to this in the show notes, but it's, it's very interesting. The main strands that she has now on this list are traditional big five publishing, other traditional publishers, small presses, 
assisted and hybrid publishing, then indie authors and self-publishing, and social publishing, which she puts under their serialisation and subscription models. Now, personally, I would split indie authors and self-publishing even further at this point, because those of us who are moving into focusing on selling direct, so Kickstarter, Shopify, WooCommerce, all of that kind of selling direct is very different from publishing through retailers like Amazon, Kobo, Apple, Barnes & Noble, etc. I mean, we are kind of, I guess, more moving into the small press arena, I guess, in that the business model is quite different. But um, regardless, this is a very useful uh, resource for understanding how diverse the publishing industry is now. I still think people who come in here new to publishing think that there are two clear choices, like a traditional publisher or self-publishing. But no, there are many, many options within that. So I'll link to that in the show notes. Also from Jane, an article uh, with the following headline, I would rather see my books get pirated than this, or why Goodreads and Amazon are becoming dumpster fires. (laughs) So Jane put this on, so I'm going to read some of the article. There's not much that makes me angry these days about writing and publishing. I've seen it all. I know what to expect from Amazon and Goodreads, meaning I don't expect much, and I assume I will be continually disappointed nor do I have the power to change how they operate. My energy-saving strategy, move on and focus on what you can control. That's going to become much harder to do if Amazon and Goodreads don't start defending against the absolute garbage now being spread across their sites. I know my work gets pirated and frankly I don't care. I'm not saying other authors shouldn't care, but that's not a battle worth my time today. But here's what does rankle me. Garbage books getting uploaded to Amazon where my name is credited as the author. Jane goes on to list various offending books, which she says are most likely generated by AI. Now, I have had this happen and I talked about this before. It's one of the things that drove me into building my own Shopify stores because I was like, what the hell? Mine happened was similar, but kind of even worse because people were publishing my Um, well, books with the same title, my name and my cover. They stole my cover (laughs) and put a plagiarised version of their book inside my cover, my name, my book title. Jane's are different titles, different books with her name associated with her account. And I have have had the same thing happen to me. I've had people put Kindle Unlimited versions of my e-books, well, not even my e-books, again, just my covers, my name under my account, even though they're nothing to do with me and I don't get paid for it. So yes, this is nothing new. (laughs) But this will obviously happen more with the ease of creating with AI. This has always happened, though. We have to acknowledge this. You know I'm AI positive, but I know AI makes it easier. But we have always had scammers, spammers, plagiarizers, pirates, and they have always done this. AI is just the latest method. The problem is not technology. The problem is humans. <laughs> um, and of course, it's not just our industry. This happens everywhere. People are people. Uh pain, people pain, but using technology. So it is only going to get worse, of course. Now I use and I'm positive, you know, uh, about AI tools. I use them in my creative, my publishing, my marketing processes. And so do you. (laughs) If you use Google or publish on Amazon KDP or use Facebook, Instagram, TikTok or X, editing tools like ProWritingAid or Grammarly, or if you are using, I mean, Gmail now has it, Google Docs, Microsoft Word is rolling this stuff out. Everything has aspects of AI. So real authors who are using AI in wonderful ways to create new things are not the same as fake authors being fake and scamming and sparring, spamming and pirating and plagiarizing and all that stuff. Please do not lump everyone together. I am a real author who uses AI tools in an ethical way. 
And if you're still listening to this after 14 years of this show, you know I'm an honest, ethical author. But clearly there is an issue here. And uh, Jane, (laughs) Jane's article has just taken off big time. I mean, it's been picked up by probably every major newspaper. Um, The Authors Guild joined in. um, Oh, because mainly because Amazon initially asked her to prove she had a trademark on her name, which of course is utterly ridiculous. That is not something that's necessary. (laughs) But... um, Uh, She did persist. The fraudulent titles were removed. But uh, this has been picked up, as I say, here in the UK, uh, the BBC, um, the, the Guardian, lots of things. And Jane says... We desperately need guardrails on this landslide of misattribution and misinformation. Amazon and Goodreads, I beg you to create a way to verify authorship or for authors to easily block fraudulent books credited to them. Do it now. Do it quickly. So is it, it, this is, again, very interesting because I talked about this in my 2020 book on AI, where I said this was going to be a problem and talked about the need for author verification and proposed using blockchain for copyright registration. So to have a kind of this is me as an author and this is my copyright and it goes on chain and then that's what is used to check all of these things, which I also discussed with Roni Levy on this show in episode 637 in about a year ago, July 2022. Now, there are still proposals being discussed around using blockchain for provenance and proof of ownership. So hopefully we will get something along these lines eventually. But in the meantime, as I said, this is why so many of us are using Kickstarter, subscription models, Shopify, building our own stores, selling direct. And as ever, if you buy my books from creativepenbooks.com and jfpenbooks.com, or if you join one of my Kickstarter campaigns, and there is one coming soon for the shadow book, you know it's me. You know you're buying my actual books, not the pirated, plagiarised, whatever, dodgy versions. Because basically, as Jane said, you can't control (laughs) what Amazon does. You can only take control of your author career. And yeah, Jane has done a fantastic job of advocating on this issue. But what is going to happen here? (laughs) The media will move on to something else next week. We can't control it. And in fact, well, the the likelihood is that AI will be the solution to the problem. But uh, as ever, these things will continue to change. And Amazon is embracing AI across the company. So for those people who say, oh, they'll just crack down on anything. Nope, (laughs) absolutely not. In the Amazon earnings call on the 4th of August, Just a week ago, CEO Andy Jassy said, every single one of Amazon's businesses has multiple generative AI initiatives going right now. They range from things that help us be more cost effective and streamlined in how we run operations and various businesses to the absolute heart of every customer experience in which we offer. It's true in our stores business. It's true in our AWS business. It's true in our advertising business, in our entertainment businesses, every single one. It's going to be at the heart of what we do. It's a significant investment and focus for us. So all in on AI with Amazon. They are encouraging creating with AI tools, including writing with AI tools through their offerings on Bedrock, which include the large language model Claude, and also advertising using AI tools. In fact, you probably may already do this through auto-targeting on AMS ads. What do you think that is, unless it is AI? (laughs) Auto-targeting means the machine does it. There is not some human sitting there doing it for Uh, the company. So it is likely there will be an AI solution to an AI problem, which which will be interesting for those people complaining about AI, essentially. The information also reports that Amazon is rolling out a tool to help write product description, which I think is hilarious because this is one of the first things that authors have been using ChatGPT and Claude and various things for. So this is from the information links in the show notes. Amazon is rolling out an artificial intelligence tool for sellers on its marketplace that will write copy for product listings. Enter keywords and it will generate a title, description and bullet points. This is still in testing phase. It's not being rolled out yet, but presumably it's coming for books as well as other products. The article also says that Amazon has been building a team to work on AI tools that will generate photos and videos for use in advertising campaigns. So there are other things happening with Amazon. 
I mentioned the potential antitrust case about to be raised by the Federal Trade Commission last week, which will look at practices that make it hard for other companies to compete. So if you own the store, you control the product, and you own and control the advertising, how can anyone compete? And Amazon are making moves in advance of this. The Wall Street Journal reports that Amazon is eliminating dozens of its private label brands, which may help placate antitrust regulators. And once again, I encourage the thought experiment. If you own the three things, the store, the product and the advertising, and you have to get rid of one of those in order to deal with the antitrust side, which do you divest? And Amazon is clearly evaluating their whole business right now. And let's face it, everyone is re-evaluating their business right now and figuring out how the next decade will look. Companies are shutting some things down and pivoting into other models. I'm doing it. I'm sure you're thinking about it. Certainly a lot of the big companies are. And I imagine Andy Jassy, CEO of Amazon, sitting with the other C-suite executives at Amazon with a list of everything that the company is at this point in history. And it's a hell of a lot bigger than just selling books on a store. Considering what they need to do for the next decade in order to grow the business and not be left behind. And what's interesting is about 10, 10, 15 years ago, uh, Jeff Bezos said Amazon will be disrupted. And I think what's going to happen is Amazon's disrupting itself. So at that point, when Jeff Bezos said Amazon will be disrupted, he said it in an interview with, with Charlie Rose, um, that, and I was just remembering this as I haven't written it down, but uh, I'll find it and link it in the show notes. But essentially, Bezos said Amazon will be disrupted. And if, it, if you think about what their business model was at that point in history, they have already disrupted themselves because back then they didn't have AWS and they didn't have AMS. Uh, Amazon marketing services. And both of those two things are the most profitable things. AWS for the cloud and of course running all these all the AI stuff and the marketing. So if if that's the way forward, they have disrupted themselves from just being a store, which is just an interesting thing. Now I am a customer of Amazon, a happy customer. I'm an Amazon shareholder as well. So I'm absolutely rooting for them to be successful. I use it for a lot of things. But as a creative and an independent author, I am not building my entire business on it. Something else happened this week that made me think books are not that high on the agenda in terms of priority of business. A survey came out from Amazon about Goodreads. Perhaps you got it too. It it just came out. um, I presume they sent it to everyone who publishes on Amazon. Um, It was... Yeah, and remember, Amazon owns Goodreads. They bought it a few years back. It essentially asked how I feel about Goodreads and it asked me to select from a list of words. <laughs> that list of words included toxic, out of date, no return on investment, and a whole load of other things that I think pushed me towards a negative end of the spectrum. Then it asked me how I promote my books and clearly had advertising paid ads as part of it. Now, there have been various news reports of review bombing over the years. So I think Amazon will either have to overhaul it completely or they will kill it. So think about Jassy and the C-suite sitting there. This is probably some tiny, tiny number on the bottom of the list. And what would you do? (laughs) So I'm calling it. I think Goodreads will be gone within the next six to 12 months. And I think there are a lot more changes ahead for Amazon. Lots more to come as this AI revolution continues. But as ever, we shall keep surfing the wave of change, not drowning in it. (laughs) I am focusing on writing, creating the best books I can, connecting with my readers and you, my listeners, directly. That is my focus. But I'd love to hear what you think. Am I completely wrong on this? Uh, yeah, as ever, you can uh, email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. That is the best way. So in personal news, I am still deep in writing my shadow book. Thanks to my patrons who've helped me with a title and a subtitle, which I'll be revealing very soon, along with a cover and launching my Kickstarter pre-launch page. Uh, so more on that to come. But I am writing pretty hard on this. It's a it's a deeply personal book. And I really help 
I really think pilgrimage helped me release a lot of blocks around this kind of memoir writing. Uh, this is kind of self-help slash memoir um, with practical things as well. And yeah, I mean, I think it's more important than ever, especially as what I was talking about before around AI. As much as I'm positive about the use of AI tools for real writers, I'm just as worried as anyone else. As I've said before, we contain multitudes, as Walt Whitman said, you, you can have deeply uh, different views on different aspects of AI. Don't lump it all together in one thing. And so, yeah, I think the important thing as we go forward into the world is human to human connection. It is the thousand true fan, fan model. It is my heart to your heart, my spirit to your spirit, human connection. And this book is about the flaws, embracing our flaws and putting them in our books, embracing what we keep hidden and being brave enough to put it into our writing. And yeah, I will be talking a lot more about this as I figure out what this book is, but I'm getting close and it's been years in the making. And so I'm I'm kind of excited, but also kind of scared. But equally, I think it's so important. It, it feels like exactly the right time for this book because we have to get deeply personal going forward because everything else can be faked. <laughs> so yeah, this book is probably my doubling down on being human book. And people have said, oh, you keep saying that, but what do you actually mean? Uh, so I will be going into that. Yeah, lots more to come on the shadow book. So thanks for all your emails and comments. Uh, I wanted to read this one from Christy, who said, please don't change the podcast. I enjoy everything about it and I tell every author I meet. Thank you, Christy. When I meet other pen podcast fans at author events, we have an instant connection. Oh, thank you. Um, I also hope the podcast remains free. Uh, the percentage of people who are unable to afford the internet and devices to view it on is increasing. The best thing about your podcast is that it's free for everyone to enjoy and learn from. With the option to buy extras, keep doing what you're doing. My week won't be the same without you. Okay, so this is interesting because I have obviously talked about how I'm going to be pivoting things, but don't worry, I'm not getting rid of the podcast. <laughs> Not at all. I'm more changing the lens of how I do things. And I've I've already started to talk about this, obviously, but the type of books I'm going to write, the type of things I want to talk about, it's already changing. You know that. It's, it is definitely changing. I'm talking about different things than things you get on other shows. So my focus is changing, but don't worry. I am keeping the podcast. It will remain very similar format. What I may do is uh, keep it moved to a sort of um, fewer interviews and do more solo shows, but we shall see. But uh, I will be talking about that more towards the end of the year when I've figured out how I want to do things. But don't worry, Christy and other people who have messaged me, I'm not getting rid of the podcast. I'm just, things are changing for me. And so uh, I will just be having a different lens on the way the show is done. And Mason said of the interview with Dan Wilcox, the no limits sampling from every table freedom thing struck the right chord with me. I'm only starting to dive deep into horror writing and reading for that matter. And it's such a breath of fresh air. Absolutely. Glad you're trying that, Mason. And Robin emailed, sent me a lovely picture of her dog in the sun and uh, bought a book from my Shopify store. Uh, I think she bought one from JF Pen. To, oh, yes, she bought Pilgrimage from jfpenbooks.com. Robin said, I just want to say how easy the shopping cart is to use. Thank you. I've always been fascinated with the Camino. I'm a fairly fit 75 and it's on my bucket list. So I'm really looking forward to reading Pilgrimage. I listen to you in all manner of places, usually while driving. But this morning it was while walking my son's retired sheepdog through the parks and streets of Palmerston North. So that is in New Zealand, where I used to live. I didn't live in Palmerston North. I lived in Auckland, but there you go. Uh, but yes, thank you for that, Robin. And uh, I met lots of people, fit 70 plus year olds on the Camino. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, is accessible to you. Uh, 
So as ever, I, uh, I'd love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation, but I am not very active on any social media channel right now. I am, like I said, I am super deep into the shadow book, but you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes. Uh, you at, um, at the creativepen.com forward slash blog. You can always find the latest episode there or leave a comment on the YouTube channel or email me, joanna at the creativepen.com. Send me pictures of where you're listening. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. Kobo Writing Life was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Digital books are now reaching more people than ever before and libraries are becoming an integral part of that. You can easily reach library readers in your KWL account and earn 50% on every library sale as there's no aggregator fee. Your book will be available to librarians to purchase for multi-loan use, but also for a one-time checkout option. If you're interested in taking part in library promotions, email KWL's dedicated author care team at writinglife at kobo.com. That's writinglife at kobo.com and they'll add you to the mailing list. And don't forget to tell your readers that they can now pick your book up in libraries. And yes, you can get my books in libraries because I absolutely understand that borrowing books from libraries is necessary and fantastic and I want to support libraries as much as I want to have my own store. (laughs) So yes, please borrow my books from libraries. Uh, If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast available wherever you get your podcasts, including where you're listening to this. Find them on social media. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. And yeah, as ever, I am wide, super wide, a super wide author now. And uh, I use Kobo Writing Life for um, ebooks, some audiobooks, library stuff. I And in fact, this week, I just went on and submitted a whole load of promotions. So even though I'm talking a lot more about Kickstarter and Shopify, I am not pulling off the other platforms. So thanks to Kobo Writing Life for being supportive of authors in so many ways. Now, this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing and keeps the show free as much as possible. But my time is sponsored by my patrons and especially the in between episodes on AI. And also I'm doing more and more stuff behind the scenes with patrons. And you can be part of the community on Patreon for just a couple of dollars a month or a few more dollars, a few more coffees if you are feeling generous. Thanks to those patrons who've been supporting the show for months and years. You are fantastic. And I'm going to be doing much more with my patrons. That is going to be part of the pivot uh, for 2024. And I've started already. I've done a a video on uh, AI stuff and uh, going to be doing a lot more as part of that uh, community. Thanks to new patrons this week, Amber R, Alex Strauss, Ardis Mayo, Jeremy O'Carroll, William F. Johnson, Rachel H. Drake, Marie Madigan and Ashley A. And if you support the show on Patreon, you get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, which will be coming up this week, probably. And I answer questions from patrons about writing craft, publishing stuff, book marketing, making money, mindset, AI, technology, selling direct, all the rest. Plus more and more behind the scenes info over time. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash The Creative Pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Tonya Duncan Ellis is the award-winning author of the Sophie Washington chapter book series and activity books, as well as a professional speaker. So welcome, Tonya. Thank you, Joanna, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, yes. And we're talking about books for children, which is a really popular topic. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. Well, I'm a Houston, Texas-based children's author, and I started writing from a very young age. When I was 10 years old, I won 
a writing competition at my school and my teachers encouraged me to continue with writing. And back then I had never met an author or thought that that was within the realm of possibility for me to become an an actual author. But I did pursue journalism. I learned about writing for newspapers because I thought that would be a great way to make an income and get a job in writing. So after college, I worked as a journalist for a while and then when I got, I, I worked in corporate America and business for a while in marketing departments. And when I got married, I have three children and I was home with them, but I was able to do freelance writing for some magazines in my community, which I did for about 10 years. And during that time, I would read a lot with my children And I had always wanted to write a book. It was kind of like a bucket list item I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I could write a children's book that might be interesting for my kids. Because living here in Houston, we have alligators in our neighborhood. We have, you'll see wild boar running around. There was all kinds of interesting things going on. And I said, this would be a fun story that I could write just for my children, kind of a fun thing to do. And so I wrote the first book in my series, Sophie Washington, Queen of the Bee, and I shared it with the librarian at my children's school. And she told me, you know, you really have something here because it has an African-American family going through just normal life experiences, not traumatic experiences, which are things you typically see when you have an African-American protagonist in a lot of the children's books that are out. So she said, this is kind of fit, fills a niche. So she supported me and promoted me with having my first school visit. And then I started doing some community events with the book and writing other books and they've just grown. And now I have sold, I have 13 books in the series and I've sold over 150,000. Wow. Books. Yes. <laughs> That is that is amazing. And uh, we're going to come back on a lot of those different things. But I, I want to ask, first of all, about the series, because you said you wrote the first book and the librarian was encouraging, and now you've got 13. And I feel like this is something that is important for success, is that one book is just not enough. But when you wrote that first book, did you decide you wanted to write a series? Or how did you decide to go into this whole series idea? I did conceive of it as a series because my children loved reading chapter book series. And so when I came up with the idea for the first book, I said, I'll have a little girl from Houston. Houston is the fourth largest city in the United States and very diverse. So I wanted to show the diversity in the series. So I came up with an idea of having a series. And my idea was maybe to have five to 10 books. And it just kept growing. So I did think about it as a series when I was conceiving the first book. Mm. And did you ever think about pitching traditional publishing with those books or did you always want to self-publish? At the beginning, I just thought about self-publishing. I didn't know much about the process of pitching to traditional publishing companies and I really didn't even imagine it growing as much as it did. It was kind of like a fun thing I wanted to do for myself. Just to, I'd always wanted to write a book. And so I didn't even think about approaching traditional publishers with these books initially. Now, one of my books, book eight in the series, Sophie Washington Code One, is about the children in a computer coding competition. And Scholastic actually bought rights to that book for a STEM program in 2021. So they did approach me with that. But when I started, I was thinking of myself as an indie author. And really Mm -hmm. I started with a hybrid company and they, I see now they were on allies list as the company to watch out for, but I didn't know that at the beginning, I didn't know anything about ally or anything. And so when I started with them, as I started growing, I realized I need to learn all the elements of being an indie author of my own. And that's kind of how I found information from your Joanna Penn, all of your educational materials on self-publishing. I ran across those and I read all your books, looked at your marketing materials and learned so much that helped me grow my series. 
Oh, well, I'm so glad to help. And just so people know, you mentioned Ally, that's the Alliance of Independent Authors, and they have a watchdog list, which has companies to watch out for. So I'll link to that in the show notes. And it's interesting because so many people start with those type of companies, because I guess you're on Google and they're the ones who are advertising usually. So I I feel that's how people get there. And we're not going to mention any names, but how did you go from working with one of those companies to deciding to do it yourself? Was it the money that, or was it that you just got a feeling that you wanted to do it yourself? It was the money as my series started taking off, they weren't paying me all my royalty checks. So I was getting frustrated. And also when I started learning things from your materials, I wanted to do more with my own marketing on Amazon and doing different things. I wanted to make my first book perma-free and I couldn't do those because they were listed as the publisher. And then I'd have to pay them every time I wanted to do anything. So I realized I wanted my series to grow and I couldn't continue with that. And then they started keeping some of my royalties Mm. and I said, no, we've got to put a stop to this. So that's when I took over the reins and learned how to do everything myself. Mm. And so how did you resolve that situation? Because again, people email me all the time and say, oh, I did this thing with this company and now I don't know what to do about it. So how did you get those books out of that situation? I had to have them write a letter. I just requested that they write a letter turning the rights back over. And my initial contract stated that they didn't have the rights to my intellectual property. So they wrote the letter and then I took over from there. Oh, well, that's quite good then. So you, so good that you checked that original contract and made sure everything, everything was good. Right. So you get all those back control, everything. So just going back to when you're creating these books in the first place, one of the hard things about books for children is illustration and you've got lovely illustrations. So how did you find that process? How did you find your illustrator and what are your tips? So for me, my books are paperback illustrated chapter books with black and white illustrations, about 20 inside each book. And then they have the cover, color cover. So initially I had a local artist in my area cover the first book and she had never illustrated a children's book. And the book cover was nice, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted. And then for the second book, I used another illustrator who was an art teacher in my children's school. And I ran into the same issue because she had not illustrated a book that had been published. And so when it came time for the third book, when I was finishing it up, I did go back to her And she was busy with some other projects. So some friends of mine had a comic book series and they had used my current illustrator for that. And I loved the images and he actually lives in India. So I said, well, let me see what he does with the third book. And I loved it. So I had him recover my, my two first two books in the series. And I've worked with him ever since. And I don't think that my relationship with him is typical from what I've heard from other authors, but what I do is it's kind of like a pay for hire situation. So I have the rights to all the images. And with each book, I will send him a detailed list of what I want, how I want them to look. And I'll send him clip art as well. And it's been a great relationship. He, his company was called Massive Brain. And I feel like he can read my mind or something because (laughs) he easily, you know, everything that I want, he pretty much produces very quickly. The only problems because he's in India, I had wild boar in one of my books and I had, and he put pigs, like he might send back something that what like farm pigs, which look different, but then I'll send him the images. So that's how we've worked together through the years. And it's been a great relationship. Mm, No, that is good. So you're very clear on what you want. Whereas I feel like some illustrators, it's more of a collaboration where the author might not be so clear, but it sounds like you, you're, you communicated very clearly what you wanted. Right. Sometimes like, for example, with the most recent book in my series, it's called Treasure Beach. I had given him parameters for the cover, but one of the other images he made looks so good. I said, let's make that the cover. 
But I do tell him exactly what I want. I tell him they're in the classroom. They need to have, they wear, they're in a private school, so they wear a uniform. So I tell him specifically what I want on most of the images. Mm. And then the stories themselves, how do you decide on the topics? So you've mentioned, I think, the spelling bee and the computer coding and the treasure hunt, I guess, that you did there. So how do you decide what stories you want each book to be? Well, they are about an 11-year-old girl from Houston and her diverse group of friends. So they're in upper elementary school. They're tween. They deal with tween issues like standing up to bullies, being true to themselves, making friends, playing with video games. So I, when I can't conceive the series, I came up with a list of ideas of topics that I wanted the character to do. And when she plays tennis, so I kind of had a list of five or six ideas that I wanted to cover. Each book teaches a lesson for the children. They're fun stories. She has a problem in each one, and then she solves them by the end. And so I just kind of had a list when I started the series of five or six topics I wanted to cover. But I also, I'm a mom of three, and some of them come from, uh, they're inspired by things that my kids do. For example, The Snitch is the second book, and they're encountering a bully. And my daughter had experienced being bullied at school, she and her friends, and they were afraid of being called a snitch more so than reporting this person that was bullying them. So I said, that would be interesting. So some of it is inspired from my kids. And I have been around children a lot as a mother. So I see a lot of different things that they're doing. And that's inspired a lot of the topics in my books. Yeah, I know that's interesting. And then coming on to the production process. So how are you actually producing the print books? So I publish them print on demand through Amazon and Ingram Spark. So with Ingram, I'm able to get them in bookstores and order copies for school visits or different events. And th- most of my sales come through print, whereas I know many indie authors get more sales with the ebooks. But I do have my books in ebook format, and three of my books are in audiobook format as well. The mm. first in the series. No, that's great. And I think obviously I've had other children's authors on and there's a big difference between what you're doing, which is the black and white chapter books that are easier to do with print on demand and the sort of full color books that are a bit younger, uh, sort of aimed at the slightly younger kids. And so I think what you're doing is the easier option in terms of the printing because you do school visits, right? And then you can just order boxes from Ingram to take to schools. Exactly. Yes, that's what I do. Mm. So you also have a lot of extras on your website. Your website is very professional. I absolutely urge people to go and have a look. It's fantastic. But you've got these colouring pages, worksheets, you've got these activity books. So why did you create all of these things? And uh, yeah, any tips on those? Well, that idea came from you again. Oh, yay. (laughs) Being a great publisher and utilizing all your resources. So after I had invested in my illustrations, since they're black and white, I said I could use these for coloring pages. So I produced the coloring books myself on Microsoft Word. I just took all the images I had and made coloring book, you know, coloring pages. And I had my illustrator make a cover for that. And then even with the activity book, I used online, there's different websites where you can make seek and finds and crossword puzzles and things like that. So I have those in writing prompts and different activities that I created for the kids just to add many add-ons and make it fun and immersive for the readers. And so, yeah, I wanted to just do as much as I could to utilize the things that I have. I also have animated book trailers on my website for all of the books and book discussion questions so that they talk about the books. Let's come back to those trailers, but just staying on the product. So in terms of your sales, have those, because the work, the activity books are paid products and then the coloring pages and the worksheets are kind of free, free downloads, right? So do the activity books actually make money? Like, are they a percentage of your sales now? 
They're not a huge percentage. They, and I don't market those as heavily as I have the books, but in particular, I came out with the activity book at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was a way to keep the fans engaged, especially with the kids at home. And I saw more of an uptick of sales on those at that time, but they're not a huge percentage. I'd say they're like a 1% if that of the total sales, but I haven't done as much marketing with those. And also at one point, I even had uh, Sophie Washington birthday napkins and plates because a couple of the fans had some parties. Mm. So I produced those as well. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because uh, you feel like, well, some of these things are worth doing and some of them are worth trying and then others don't work. Or And maybe have you taken those work books, sorry, the activity books into schools as well? Or do you just take the main books? I take the main books. Now, I was doing a lot of live events and even like farmers markets and different things like that. And I did sell a lot of the activity books in particular to, and I do have coloring books that are a hundred pages of coloring sheets, even though I offer one or two free on my website. So those could be sold to younger siblings who weren't able to read the chapter books. So when I bring those to live events, I do find them selling. And because I produce those completely myself, I didn't pay much for the cover you know, the outlay to produce those was very minimal. So I do make a pretty good profit on them when I sell those. And talking to you, maybe I I do need to promote those more because they're cheaper to produce Mm. in the actual, yeah. yeah. Than the books. And yes, cheaper to produce, but you can actually price them sometimes higher. Right, right, exactly. So now talking to you, I may need to start pushing those more. Yeah. Or, I mean, and this is what we have to think is how could, I mean, because I do workbooks obviously for my nonfiction books. And again, I mean, they don't, they don't have as much content in, they have no content, they have lines in and questions, but people pay for those because they want to do things themselves. So it's kind of a different product. I feel like we forget these and I love it that you're doing it with fiction. I mean, you know, your stories are are fiction, but I did, um, let's come back on the school visit. So on your website, you have, again, a really professional school visit page with professional speaking rates and a brochure, which is fantastic. Now, I've spoken to a lot of children's authors and they are pretty reticent to charge money or they feel, I don't know, they feel funny about it. So how did you go for this in such a professional way? Did you always do it like that or have you kind of started charging over time? Well, when I first started out, I did free visits in, this is maybe in 2018, I did do some free visits in some schools in my area, but I have a very professional presentation where I talk about my author journey. I teach children about writing and even I have my presentations geared to helping them meet standards for certain tests that they have to take here in the U.S. Mm. So I'm teaching them different things. I even do writing workshops. So I feel like this is a a needed service for the children and that it's worth my, um, you know, I need to be paid for what I'm doing. So I started charging maybe after doing four or five visits. And I'm also a member of a a Facebook group called Create Engaging School Visits. So it's a forum where authors talk about how we need to value ourselves as creatives in our work. And not Mm. to sell ourselves short out here because, but I don't feel funny about it at all because I've actually seen children inspired to write. One young girl who I met during a school visit, she wanted to write and her mother reached out to me and I got her connected with a writing competition. She won $400 and now she's out going to different events, promoting her book and doing different things. So these author visits can play a huge role in encouraging literacy with the children and inspiring them. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And I mean, obviously you prepare, like you said, you have a professional presentation 
And again, even just the look of your website, I think, can make people feel it's that value. And I'm not saying that people who do things for free aren't offering something of value. It's just that we're creatives, as you say, and we need to value our own time and getting paid for these things. And you're actually doing a lesson and and you might not have books, your books might not get bought by the school. So getting paid for the visit's important. But how do you, like you've got this brochure. So how do you market to schools? I send the brochures out to schools. I email them and send the brochure out. And prior to the pandemic, I was doing almost weekly events and I was meeting lots of school teachers and librarians and talking to them about the series. So that was a great way for me to connect with them and book school visits. But recently I've started with those brochures and sending out emails directly to the librarians. And are you still just focusing in Houston or are you doing online stuff elsewhere? I've done virtual school visits. Houston's such a large community that I can stay pretty busy in my own area, but I also got a booking agent who's in Austin, Texas, to try to get booked in some other areas outside my city, you know, Mm. so I tried to do that as well. Mm. And I I have virtual, so I am open. I can do virtual school visits anywhere. Yes, well, that's what I thought. And especially for also internationally, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, have you thought about doing things to the UK? Because it's so funny. A lot of Americans say to me, oh, I love your accent. And I'm like, yeah, because it's different to your accent. And I hear your accent and I think, well, people will love your accent too. And when you speak to a different country, it's almost like you're almost naturally more interesting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Exactly. That is true. It just seems more highbrow when I hear the English accent. So it's <laughs> I think that's quite funny. Okay. So just coming back to the schools. So how, so you charge for the visit, which is fantastic, but how do you incorporate book sales into school visits? I send ahead an order form to the librarian. So once we discuss booking me to come in, I send ahead the order form. So if the children want their book autographed beforehand, I can have some of those ready. And I bring extra as well, because inevitably teachers and some of the other staff may want to purchase books as well. And I ask them also for the group sizes. We talk about the space I'll be in. Sometimes I might need a microphone. I always ask for help from an audiovisual tech person, because inevitably There's going to be some kind of little snafu and I'm not the best at setting up all the tech. And I make sure to get there at least a half an hour early to get everything set up properly. No, it's I mean, I do professional speaking and all of that is exactly the same. I mean, it's a professional speaking event. So any awful mistakes or lessons learned or things that you would like to tell to people who want to do this type of thing? have gone pretty well for me most of the time. I would say be prepared with your presentation. I remember one virtual presentation I had, for some reason, I could not see the slides I had. And fortunately, I had printed them out. This was, and it was virtual during the pandemic. And um, no, I hadn't printed them out, but I knew my presentation well enough that I could just talk through and handle everything. And I try to be prepared in case something goes wrong with your PowerPoint or whatever to make it engaging, especially with the children. So that if something goes wrong and you can't use slides, if that was what you had intended, you have something to engage the kids and some kind of activity for them. Yeah. I mean, that is a difficult audience. (laughs) I haven't done things to kids and I don't have kids. So that would actually terrify me. (laughs) And it's funny because for me, I'm more comfortable talking with children than with adults because I did a talk for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators in New York earlier this year, and it went great. But I had way more anxiety with that than I have when I'm preparing to speak with the children. Yeah, maybe it's a different fear when it's with peers or people who are in the 
publishing industry it's yeah. a very different form of judgment than kids who might judge you by just thinking you're boring or I don't know what else kids think <laughs> right exactly and I did want to state again when you talked about some authors may feel bad about charging in the beginning I started to feel resentment after a few times doing it free when someone asked me to do something free and I said you know I want to my work is valuable. And I encourage all authors, if you've prepared and you're confident in your presentation, you've got valuable information to share and you're providing a service. So you shouldn't sell yourself short. Yeah. I think that resentment is a very good indicator. I remember when I started out self-publishing and talking about things back in almost like 2008, 2009. And I did a bit of consulting back then. And I started really low, like 99 US dollars for an hour. And I remember feeling quite quickly, this is, I'm being too cheap. I'm too cheap. I'm getting too many bookings and I'm resenting the time. And so I put it up until I felt more comfortable. And then I just stopped doing it altogether. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but did you ratchet up your fees over time until you felt like it was about what you were happy with? Well, after I joined that Create Engaging School Visits website, some of the other authors shared what they charge. Mm. So that gave me a feel. And there's also an author named Kim Norman who has a book about school visits that's a great resource. Her name's Kim Norman. She has a book about doing school visits and she's she makes over like six figures a year doing school visits. So she gives all kinds of great information in that book. So that mm. was very helpful to me. Right. So that book is called Sell Books and Get Paid Doing Author School Visits, which is a fantastic book title (laughs) by (laughs) Kim Norman. (laughs) So that's great. I do think that's important because it's all about multiple streams of income. And that's what you're doing. You've got the books, but you've also got the school visits. So let's come back to marketing because many authors, uh, children's authors, well, everyone struggles with marketing. So what, but you were in corporate marketing, uh, you mentioned earlier. So what have been the most effective forms of marketing? marketing for your books? I feel like the best thing for me was starting out locally. And because I'm in a large market here in Houston, I did a lot of events and got a groundswell of support from librarians and teachers in my community. And then they started sharing my work on Twitter and anytime I would do and Instagram. So anytime I would do events, I would take pictures of the children with my book and get permission from their parents. Mm. So I was posting those on social media and that helped get the word out about my book all around the world. And that was a big thing that helped me in the beginning. Another thing was getting lots of reviews, positive mm-hmm. reviews for my books. And I made the first in the series Perma Free and got a lot of books. And with it being free, I think a lot of teachers started reading it and give it, that gave them, made them give my series a chance as an indie series. I think got it some exposure. So those are things. And I also, now I have an email list. So I've been working on being consistent with that. And I think that helps, especially with school visits. Because when people are seeing what I'm doing and I'm continuing to connect with them, and even I'll put things about school visits I've done and I've seen then I get some other bookings when I'm showing those in my email. Well, the email list is interesting because, of course, your email list is not full of 11 year old children. So who are those people on your email list? Most of them are educators and parents or grandparents that are on my list. And some are the parents of another thing. I had something called my Sophie's Club Ambassadors. So I made children, I invited them to be ambassadors for my brand and gave them Sophie Washington t-shirts and other little swag and perks. And I they had to, as condition of being an ambassador, post a photo of them with their favorite book and shirt, which helped market my books. And then the parents like seeing their children encouraged to read and seeing them promoted. Because I do a lot to highlight children who are doing well and encouraging them with reading and literacy. And so the parents like that as well. 
Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So you mentioned before the animated book trailers, and I did have a look at one of them on your site, and they look great, but I have done book trailers myself and I have found them to be expensive and not very useful. So how have you right. found your book trailers? They haven't done that much. My illustrator isn't too expensive. So that was something that enabled me to continue with them. So they don't bring that much money or there's no way for me to even really measure that. But with the launches, I would have the trailer. So I just continue with it because it wasn't that costly. My illustrator took some of the images we already had and kind of incorporated them. I write the scripts and give him the music to use. So it wasn't that costly for me. If it had been, I wouldn't have made them. Mm, Yes. So I think that's a really important point for people is some of these things that are more expensive aren't worth doing, whereas the things that were kind of free financially, like you said about local marketing, although they take time, they can actually be more effective. So what about things like advertising? Are you doing any ads, paid advertising on Amazon or anything? I do do Amazon ads. I I just went wide with my books Uh, about four months ago, because I had a company looking at buying my series and I needed to get them wide. I had been on Kindle Unlimited and I do do Amazon ads. So those help with sales. And I've also done ads through BookBubs. I've had BookBub feature deals, which has been helpful. And occasionally I'll do a fussy librarian or bargain booksy and different things like that ads for my eBooks. And what about networking and co-promoting with other children's authors? That's been fantastic for me because I'm very active on Instagram. And during the pandemic, I was part of a community called Own Voices Book Challenge. And it was a group of other children's authors. So we started building community, networking, uh, promoting each other's books. And I also have on Instagram an Instagram live show called Write This, where I interview different authors in the industry. And I started it when I was selected to be in a group sponsored by the Highlights Foundation because it was through Zoom. It was a group of other authors and I wanted to get to know them and it was difficult on Zoom. And I said, well, I could do an interview, then I can start talking to people and getting to know them. And that's been a fabulous way of me building connections in my industry with other authors who promote me. I promote them. They may tell me about different opportunities. So that's networking has really played a huge role in my growth as well. Mm. Just on the, uh, I'm interested in the technical side, because I obviously we're doing this on Zoom. I've never done an interview on Instagram. What do you use to do an interview on Instagram? It's really simple. You just go live on Instagram. So on your page, there's a button to push live. Just on your phone? Yeah, on your phone. And it's through the phone, not your computer. And then they join me. People do have anxiety when they're when I've asked them to interview if they've never done it, but it's very simple. So I just click a button and it sends them an invitation. They click it and they're on the screen with me. And then we interview, I interview them for maybe a half an hour. And then I also upload the interviews onto my YouTube channel. Ah. Okay, that's interesting. So you actually invite someone, you're, you you go live on Instagram and then you can invite someone into the show, basically. Exactly. And then we're live on the interview. And then afterwards, I can save that interview. Mm, there we go. <laughs> I haven't done one on Instagram. And to be fair, like we, I record all of these and we're not live, so I can edit it and I feel a lot more comfortable and there's no problem about any of that. But I'm just not very confident with live video. So it's interesting that you're really comfortable with it. So were you always comfortable or is that something you've learned? I've learned because I was nervous. I remember when I would first go live, I would get everything perfect and do all this And I remember actually my daughter, who's a young adult, she was, when I did my first live, I did all this and then it didn't save. And it had gone. (laughs) And she's like, all you do is push a button. You know, I'm like, I am so stressed and it didn't even save, but I've gotten more comfortable. I've done maybe 30 
interviews on there. And I've interviewed some top people in the children's book world. So I'm very happy with the interviews. And they've gone well. One on one interview, one of my friends had a nosebleed while we were talking oh during the live interview. So we had, we're like, ah, but it, she covered it and we just kept going. So different things do happen when you're live. Yeah. And probably people love that. They're like, oh, that's just totally normal, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's been fun. I've enjoyed it because it's enabled me. And I'm sure you see this too, just to meet so many different people in the industry. So it's been a lot of fun and learn a lot from what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. This podcast is brought me a lot of friends and contacts over the years. So yeah, I think networking with other authors is so important. And I guess if, um, because there's so many, so many things I want to ask you actually, but let's get to the more the, the business side, because I feel like children's books have to have more investment because of the illustration usually. And because the book number of books sold is usually smaller, although you've sold 150,000 books, so you're doing super well. But when did this become like a proper business for you? When were you like, okay, this can be a good business as opposed to just a hobby? I think after I had my fifth book and it started selling and I had one child send me a picture of her dressed as the character. And I'm like, wow, this is part of these children's childhood. They love this. You know, I got really excited and I felt just encouraged to push on and go in. And one day I sold a thousand books, I guess Mm. a school or something had bought one of one book. And so those type things have encouraged me that this is something that people want But still, the margin per book is not huge, and I have to continue with the school visits. And then industry, I've been embraced by the industry. I'm a member of the Society of Children's Books, Writers, and Illustrators. So they asked me to speak at their national conference with Jane Friedman on marketing, Hmm. children's authors. So those type things encourage me and make me feel like I'm this is my career and I'm doing, you know, able to continue with this. So you did, you recently announced a traditional book deal as well. So tell us about that and how that happened. Right. So I have a book coming out in 2024, spring of 2024, a picture book called They Built Me for Freedom. And it's about Emancipation Park, where the first Juneteenth celebration was held. And it's here in Houston, Texas, where I live, the park. And what happened is that I was participating in a virtual SCBWI conference with a manuscript I had. I submitted it for a critique. And unbeknownst to me, it was put in for a competition because I just put it in just to get a critique from an agent just to see what they thought of it. So she met with me and said, told me she had recommended it to win for a prize. And I was like, what is that? So, and she suggested I write picture books. Mm. And she also told me I should get an agent. And she wasn't taking new clients at the time, but she encouraged me to try to get an agent with that manuscript. So it did win in the competition. And so I just queried agents and ended up getting an agent within a couple of months with that manuscript. And it and in the meantime, I was intrigued when she talked about me writing picture books because I was saying, well, what? I really hadn't thought about it. But at that conference, another author who I admire read her picture book and I, all of us were crying on the Zoom and I was saying, wow, I want to write something like this. This is so beautiful and impactful. This is the kind of thing I want to write. So I started learning all I could about picture books. So, and I also read that book, The Artist Way, which tells you to take artist field trips. Mm, The artist date, the artist date. Yeah, Mm. take the artist date. So I went, I would try to go to different places and I happened to go to that park. And that's when lines from the book that I wrote came to me and I wrote the picture book. And this is before Juneteenth was a holiday. And I told my agent, this book, Juneteenth is going to be a holiday. Somehow I, just from what I was hearing, I'm like one day, or this is something people need to know about. So she sent it out on submission, which is where you're sending it out for publishing companies to consider it. And it ended up selling. So that's how I got the deal. The other book 
never made it. My initial manuscript that I landed my agent with was rejected over 20 some times. And we just kind of shelved that one. But the picture book did sell. Well, just for people who are not in the USA, what is Juneteenth? So Juneteenth is a time when enslaved people in Texas learned they were free. It happened two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So the people in Texas didn't hear that they were free until two years later when a general, General Gordon Granger, came to Galveston, Texas and announced that they were free. So that was the time when all African-Americans were enslaved people were all freed. And then the park that I'm writing about is where they held celebrations to celebrate. And the park has had a 150 year anniversary a year or so ago. So, and it's a beautiful space here in Houston. And actually the architect who did work on the African-American Museum in Washington, D.C., he did work on some of the buildings here in Houston in the mm. Emancipation Park. And it has beautiful sculptures and artwork in the park. It's a gorgeous park. And, and so, then, it, yeah. Why is it Juneteenth? I mean, it's in June, right? Is it like the June the 10th or June? Why? What's the 10th? So the 10th is the, the day. It's June 19th. Ah, okay. That's why it's called Juneteenth, yes. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of the listeners are not in the USA, so it's good to clear that up. But yes, so so many interesting things you've got going on. But even if your traditional books take off, will you still carry on with the Sophie Washington? Well, I have it said in my contract that I can continue with Sophie Washington, but I do have 13 books in the series. So I am pursuing some other traditional projects because I actually sold another book after I sold the Juneteenth book, but it hasn't been formally announced, but to my that same publisher. And it's HarperCollins Balzer and Bray imprint. Fantastic. So yeah. where can people find you and your books online? They can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Tanya Ellis Books. And on Twitter at Tanya D. Ellis, and also on the new threads at Tanya Ellis Books. My website is tanyaduncanellis.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Tanya. That was great. Thank you so much for having me, Joanne. I'm honored to be here and thrilled to speak with you. So I hope you found the discussion with Tonya interesting and that it helps you reflect on how you might value your time as part of your author business, whether that's specifically around speaking or school visits or however you use your time, because we only have a limited amount of time. So what do you want to use that for? So next week, I'm talking about how to build a successful author business for the long term with Joe Solari. And we got on really well and geeked about business. (laughs) So uh, I hope you will find it useful. I certainly did. So in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.